My name is Leela Panika, and I'm from Trees, the lead for the Environment Cluster Beach uh, of the CSO Platform for Reform that is made up of over 100 CSOs and organizations across Malaysia. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you today for Beach webinar on Butterflies of Peninsula Malaysia and Stingless Bees of Malaysia. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. We are here to learn more about the important roles played by our butterflies and native stingless bees. There are more to butterflies than meets the eye. They do more for us than just add color and beauty to our gardens. They also play an important role in our ecosystem. Sting stingless bees, apart from producing honey, perform a major function in indicating and maintaining a balanced ecosystem has a natural pollinator. They play a significant role in crop pollination that contributes to the global food supply and food security. We are honored and excited to have with us today our two speakers, Dr. Rosalie Omar, who is a TREES volunteer, and Associate Professor Dr. Wahizatul Afzan Azmi, a senior lecturer with University of Malaysia Trangano, right, uh, UMT. I will now hand over the session to Cik Siti Fatima to talk about the housekeeping rules. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lula, for the kind introduction. So I will go through the rules, uh, housekeeping rules, before we start. So please make sure that your Zoom ID follows this format. So I believe everybody here has their names already as their Zoom ID. But if you would like to indicate uh, if you're representing your school, institution or organization, you can put it as well uh, next to your name as like the example. And then the next rules are the four golden rules here. Please be mindful that this session will be recorded. Please stay muted at all times unless there is a need to speak during the Q&A session. Use the chat functions for any questions or feedback during the presentations to avoid interruptions. And you may use the raise hand icon to indicate if you would like to speak during the Q&A session. So that is all from me. Thank you for your kind attention and I will pass it back to Ms. Lisa for the webinar. Thank you, Siti, for going through the housekeeping rules. Uh, Dr. Rosli Omar is our first speaker tonight, and he will be doing a presentation on butterflies of Peninsular Malaysia. He is a committed environmentalist oh, and nature yes, yes, lover. Yes, he is oh, the author sorry. of the he is the author of the book Birds of the Forest of Peninsular Malaysia, a photographic guide. He is now together with two co-authors writing a book, Butterflies of Peninsular Malaysia, that has been commissioned by the Ministry of Technology and Natural Resources. A reminder to everyone, please type in your questions and feedback in the chat for the Q&A session after Rosalie's presentation. I will now pass the session over to Dr. Rosalie. Rosalie? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Leela. Okay, uh, this is uh, the title of my talk, um, Butterflies of Peninsula Malaysia and their roles in the ecosystem. <clears throat> uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, Right, this is the uh, outline of my talk. Uh, yeah? Uh, we can't see your screen. Can't see my screen? Yes. Well, what's happening? <clears throat> Have you shared your screen? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, hold on, yeah. Oh, 
<clears throat> okay, uh, something is wrong. <laughs> Maybe Dr. Wahi will have to go first. Uh, Lila? Can we we have your presentation? Do you want us to play it? Uh, yeah, maybe you can maybe you can uh, uh, show screen from from your from your side. Yes. Uh, just give us a, a, a minute, everyone. Uh, our apologies. Everything was working just now. Okay, uh, let me uh, let me try again. Let me try again. <clears throat> Anna Bole. Bole, yeah? Anna Bole. Okay, uh, hopefully now you can see the, the screen. <clears throat> uh, so okay. my, the, the title is uh, Butterflies of Peninsula Malaysia and their roles in the ecosystem. Right, this is the outline of my talk. Okay, uh, <laughs> there are just too many. Um, um, I'll skip this. Um, along the way, I'll be showing um, photos of uh, our butterflies. Uh, in, for example, here is uh, the English name is uh, the clipper. The Malay name is layar, which is uh, an adaptation or translation of the clipper. <clears throat> um, previously, uh, before this, uh, there are no Malay names for butterfly. Uh, for 200 years, uh, British and other uh, Oram Pute have been, um, have been uh, uh, studying our butterflies, but uh, we don't have Malay names for them. So uh, together with uh, two um, colleagues, uh, we have uh, adapted the uh, English names to Malay. Um, this is the, the, the scientific name is Parthenos Sylvia Lila Kinus. Uh, this is the genus, the genus. This is, Sylvia is a, uh, the sub the species name and they like you know is a, a subspecies name <clears throat> right um most of my uh um referen re re references uh, are are to uh, the book by Corbett and Pendlebury uh first published uh, probably 1932 the fifth edition now uh 2020 um uh for short i'll i'll just call it um uh, uh cmp5 so according to them there are 1051 butterfly species for peninsula malaysia and singapore now three are exclusive to singapore thus for peninsula malaysia we have 1048 species uh, for Malaysia as a whole, according to uh, uh, I Naturalist, we have 1,300 uh, species. Now compare that with um, 1287 species in Thailand, which is uh, much larger than, uh, than uh, Earth. Uh, for the USA, which is even much, much uh, larger, they have uh, 750 species. And for the whole of the European Union, they only have 482 species. Uh, this butterfly is called the Tony Foster. I did an uh, internet search, what is Foster? It seems to be um, some kind of a uh, seller. Eh? Uh, so, I, so we translated that as penjual. Uh, Oren is a... The color tony, yeah? we don't quite have the uh, uh, the, the color tony. So, 
penjual orange. <coughs> uh, butterfly families in the world there are seven uh, butterfly families in all. In Peninsula Malaysia there are only six uh, families. There is one family not available here, uh, available only in uh, South America. So the six families are Papilionidae with uh, 45 species here, Pieridae 47, Nymphalidae 281, Reodionidae 16 species, Lycanidae 402 species, and the six uh, Hesperidae with 260 species. The Hesperidae are, are what we call the, uh, the skippers. <clears throat> uh, this is an example of the skipper, uh, the silver spotted lancer, a forest species. Um, our national butterfly from the family Papilionidae is the Raja Brooks uh, birdwing. Uh, there are two uh, subspecies here. Uh, this is the female nectaring on lantana camara flowers or in Malay, the bunga tahi ayam. Uh, this uh, butterfly was described by uh, Alfred Russell Wallace um, when he saw it in Sarawak in 1855. Uh, this is the male um, paddling, paddling for minerals. Uh, paddling means uh, they, they are sucking minerals necessary for healthy sperms. As you can see, the male is different from the female, and this is called sexual dimorphism. Uh, some species are male and female different, but others are the same. Uh, butterfly flight pattern. You may, you might have noticed um, some species, they fly fast and chaotically. Others are slow, languid, without a care in the world. Now, the fast and chaotic, they are generally dull. Uh, they are non-toxic and thus uh, are food for birds and animals. <clears throat> Those that are slow and languid uh, are usually colorful. What we call, they have aposematic coloring. They are advertising to the world that they are toxic, unpalatable, challenging um, predators to try and uh, eat them. <clears throat> so where does this uh, toxicity uh, come from? Uh, it comes from what the caterpillar uh, um, feed on. If they feed on um, a toxic uh, um, leaves or plants, then that toxicity will be passed on to the pupa and to the adult butterfly. So this, uh, the top one is a, an example of a fast flying butterfly uh, and non-toxic. This is a jeweled nawab. Uh, the bottom one is a slow flyer, the white tiger, or some people call it the black vein tiger. Uh, some of you might recognize uh, the, the genus, Danaus. This is of the same, um, the same uh, species as uh, the monarch butterfly in the US, um, famous, for their, famous for their migration, thousands of uh, miles from the USA to Mexico. <clears throat> but they are in trouble now, 90% um, uh, uh, re re reduced in uh, abundance. <clears throat> um, identification of, uh, of a species may require the, ma uh, the male upper side, the male underside, and the female upper side and underside views, i.e. you may need up to four views uh, to, um, uh, to ident identify correctly a species. Uh, for example, this is the Malay lacewing. Uh, on top is a of uh, is male, uh, bottom is female, and uh, this is uh, uh, the male on the side, and this is the female on the side. So they are all uh, different views. <clears throat> right, uh, butterfly or moth. 
Both are of the order Lepidoptera. Uh, scientific, scientifically, no difference between them, but as we know, uh, butterflies uh, generally they don't look like uh, moths. So these are the uh, general characteristics, which uh, can be. Um, there are exceptions to each of the general characteristics. <clears throat> so butterflies are uh, generally active during the day, diurnal. Uh, wings are upright uh, at rest. The antenna is club-ended. I'll, uh, I'll see. I'll say more about this uh, later. Uh, next slide. That hind wings are independent of the front wing, whereas for moths, they are generally uh, nocturnal. Wings spread flat at rest. The antenna are feathery or thread-like, um, etc. Except they are not club-ended like uh, like uh, um, butterflies. But again, there, there are exceptions. Yeah? Hind wings are coupled to the front wings. <clears throat> uh, this is a tasamo. Uh, you can just about see the treasury antenna here. <clears throat> okay, to be clearer, this is the treasury antenna of a moth, and the, the wings are rest, rested flat. Yeah? <clears throat> and this is uh, the red Helen butterfly. Uh, the antenna at the end are uh, club ended, yeah, um, a thicker compared to the to the stem. <clears throat> uh, nectar food, <clears throat> uh, butterfly flowers. Flowers are brightly colored, unscented. Remember that they are active uh, during the day. So, and detection is by sight. So the flowers need to be uh, brightly colored. Yeah? And since uh, they are bright, brightly colored, uh, no need to be scented. <clears throat> uh, most flowers, flowers are white and scented. Uh, because uh, they are nocturnal, uh, there is um, no need for color. Eh? You can't see color at night. <clears throat> but, uh, the flowers need to be scented and the, the moss um, 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 <clears throat> detect the flowers uh, by, by smell. Um, worldwide, there are 160,000 species of uh, moss, whereas for butterflies, only about 18,000 species. So 10 times less species than moss. So why uh, are there more moths, so much more moths than, um, than uh, butterflies? Um, I tried to find the answer, but uh, I just, just couldn't find it to tell you. Probably my question is then, since moths are nocturnal, maybe, maybe there are more plants with flowers that bloom at night. So I tried to ask uh, a few, um, plant specialists, but they, uh, they couldn't answer me. Uh, butterfly habitats. <clears throat> uh, five habitats uh, that uh, we are going to look at. Mangroves, uh, open country, lowland dry forest, lowland rainforest, and highland rainforest. This is the swamp tiger. You can find it only in, the, in mangroves. Uh, Originally, the name is uh, Malay tiger, but because, as I said, uh, they are only found in mangroves, a swamp tiger is more, uh, more descriptive. <clears throat> right, this is the underside of the uh, swamp tiger. And this is uh, the photo of the Matang boardwalk in Kuala Sepatang Perak uh, that I took um, several years ago. Uh, other butterflies in this habitat, uh, the mangrove tree nymphs, which is very rare. Uh, the king crow, the palm bob. Open country are uh, cleared, modified lands. Example, urban gardens, parks, wayside uh, vegetation, roadsides, plantations, rubber, oil palm, coconut, and orchards. <clears throat> 
uh, some butterflies in this habitat, uh, the plain tiger as shown here. Common mormon, lemon emigrant, uh, the pansies, uh, the blue pansy, the peacock pansy, gray pansy, etc. Uh, they are really colorful uh, butterflies, that's why they are called uh, uh, the pansies. So again, this is of the, the plain tiger, is again of the Danau's uh, genus. Lowland dry, lowland dry forest. Uh, this is tropical forest as opposed to uh, equatorial forest. Uh, this thing dry season, December to February. This is in the northwest uh, of Peninsula Malaysia, north of Sungai Kedah, Langkawi, and Perlis. So this region is called by Corbett and Pendlebury as Kedawi. There are some uh, 20 species found here and not found uh, anywhere else uh, in Peninsula Malaysia. Mm, an example either is the scarce blue tiger found in Langkawi only. So Langkawi has a quite number of uh, uh, endemic species there. <clears throat> uh, next habitat, uh, lowland rainforest. These are forests below 750 meters above sea level. Uh, this is by this is uh, the criteria by Corbett and Pendlebury. Others uh, take it as below 800 meters, and some others uh, as below 900 meters. <clears throat> uh, the the lowland rainforest has the highest biodiversity, especially the plains level forests, uh, those below 150 meters, but very little left. Uh, in the country because we've uh, 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 destroyed them. <clears throat> Highest butterfly diversity in, uh, in the lowland rainforest, but few individuals. As opposed to uh, the open habitat, they have less species, but greater population. <clears throat> uh, butterflies in the lowland rainforest, uh, some examples are common fawn, the jungle glories, the palm kings, the humans, etc. Um, shown here is uh, an example um, um, that, of, that can be found in the lowland rainforest, uh, the tufted jungle king. Uh, often you can find it on the on the ground itself, feeding on uh, rotten fruit and uh, and uh, others. <clears throat> Right, uh, the last uh, habitat is a uh, highland rainforest. This is above 750 meters above sea level. Uh, not as many butterfly species as in the lowland forest. Uh, some butterflies here are most of the Jezebel and most of the cage blues. Uh, an example is this uh, red based Jezebel. Uh, Jezebel, we translated that as a pangoda. So the old, uh, the old British uh, researchers, they surely know how to name their butterflies. Uh, butterf butterfly distribution, uh, half in the lowland. Um, so total 1,048, so half that is 524 species in the lowland. Uh, one seventh in the mountains. So that is about 150 species. The remainder, the remainder are, are at all elevations. So that's uh, 375 species. Uh, so in total, lowland species, there are 900. Mountain species, 525. So just uh, um, about half uh, of that in the in the lowlands. Eh? <clears throat> uh, so we have mentioned that uh, uh, there are more species, uh, more diversity in the in the lowlands. Eh? Population abundance. Um, this is uh, most butterflies. You can see them a lot in April to uh, September. This is the southwest monsoon. 
which is relatively dry. Uh, some species, however, their abundance uh, is in December to uh, May. Uh, shown here is uh, the branded imperial. Um, you can see uh, ants. This is also an ant next to uh, the butterfly. So why are they friendly? Uh, this is because uh, the caterpillar of this butterfly uh, feeds on aphids, um, and these aphids are sort of farmed by the by the ants. Uh, what for? Um, okay, the the caterpillar they feed on secretions. <clears throat> uh, the 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 caterpillars they feed on the aphids. And uh, the caterpillars secrete out um, sweet uh, honeydew-like honey uh, uh, stuff that the ants like. So symbiosis. Huh? So um, so the ants tolerate the the butterfly, the adult. <clears throat> right. The roles uh, played by uh, butterflies. Uh, one as uh, pollinators that that we all know. Uh, this is uh, the common mime ready to land on these uh, Ixora uh, flowers. <clears throat> I think that this is where the the proton got its name Exora. Um, second role as uh, nutrient recyclers. Uh, the bottom here is a pallet thorn uh, feeding on rotten fig fruit and here the above here is uh, the chocolate albatross feeding on um, uh, animal waste i reckon some uh, bird poo so so but in this uh, role the butterflies uh, get rid of uh, uh, smelly stuff otherwise our world be will be uh, very smelly and not only smelly but disease disease yeah <clears throat> so when they die or when they are eaten by um, uh, uh, other animals uh, the nutrients will be recycled uh, the third one um, they are prey or food to birds and other animals right uh, conservation <clears throat> Given the importance uh, as pollinators, uh, nutrient recyclers, and food for others, butterfly decline is a disaster. Uh, butterfly and moth populations decline more than 80% in 50 years in Germany. 24 of 58 butterfly species could be extinct in Britain soon. Note that Britain, which is about the same size as Malaysia, they only have 58 species. And nearly, all, nearly half of them could be extinct soon. Uh, declining too in Malaysia. Uh, but I reckon um, there need to be, uh, there to, uh, to be more research on the extent of the decline as what uh, has been done in uh, Germany, in Britain and many developed uh, countries. 40% yeah? mm. of insect species declining in the world. Extinction rate for insects is eight times faster than for mammals or birds. Uh, I'm sure we know that mammals or birds are um, you know, greatly in danger of extinction, but probably more, uh, most of us uh, don't really know that uh, insects are uh, in greater danger. And why should we bother? If we lost insects, the whole ecosystem would collapse. Now, a scientist asks, uh, if uh, humans were, were to, be dis to disappear from the earth, what would happen? Well, not much. Uh, in fact, um, in fact uh, the world would uh, revive. Uh, the forest would uh, recover. Um, birds would recover and probably our, our Harimau Malaya too would uh, uh, recover. Yeah? <clears throat> uh, so, but if we lost our insects, uh, that's it. Yeah? 
catastrophe. So what are the causes of the uh, uh, lost um, insect decline? Uh, the usual suspect, habitat disruption. Uh, we've been felling our forests. We have been draining our, our wetlands. Uh, we have been cutting our mangroves. Uh, secondly, pesticide use. They're really killing our insects. And more and more, the impact of climate change. And probably not many realize that our street lights are killing our nocturnal insects. The street lights uh, attract insects and basically kill them. Uh, scientists say we are in the, in the beginning of the sixth mass extinction. Uh, what is it? Uh, in the history of the Earth, there has been five major mass extinctions, the fifth being uh, the extinction of, uh, of the dinosaurs when an asteroid hit Earth. But the sixth mass extinction will be caused by Earth humans. All the rest, the, all, the, all the five uh, were caused by natural causes. Yeah? So uh, to prevent ecosystem collapse, we need to conserve butterflies and other insects and wildlife in general. Uh, fauna, uh, flora and fauna, they are in symbiosis. Uh, they need each other. You lose one, we lose the other. You lose the pollinators, you lose the seed dispersers, may, will mean no new plants. Yeah? No new plants mean the, the fauna too will be gone in time. <clears throat> Right, so what can you do? Uh, grow native plants that attract butterflies, uh, also attract moths and attract birds. Uh, I underline native because many are just planting anything that looks nice, but no imported plants, uh, they may look nice, but they might become invasive meaning they could uh, out, uh, outgrow, outcompete with our native plants. Uh, when, when that happens, they will not fit in to our ecosystem. Yeah? So that goes uh, not only for plants, but for animals too. Yeah? Please do not import and um, import pet um, that, yeah, yeah, don't import foreign, foreign uh, pet, yeah? Um, and also our municipal uh, um, DBKL one and whatnot, they just love to plant colorful flowers, but many, when you look closely, it's, uh, it's lifeless. Uh, there, there, there are no insects, nothing there. Um, so we need to plant flowers that attract uh, birds, uh, butterflies, and other insects. Yeah? And after that, they provide uh, food for birds and other creatures. And let a corner or the border of your garden grow wild. Uh, butterflies, insects, love wildness, not manicured gardens. And please switch off unnecessary garden lights, uh, which will kill uh, nocturnal uh, creatures. And if your garden is, uh, is successful after that planting, this uh, common moment uh, might visit your flowers. Right, that's it. That's my presentation. Thank you, uh, Beach, for inviting me. And thank you, uh, you, for uh, listening to me. Uh, questions are welcome. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Rosely. We'll, we'll now begin the Q&A session. Uh, while we wait for everyone to uh, for questions from the audience, um, can we just ask you? Uh, you had mentioned that uh, we have to take photographs of the upper side and underside of both the male and female uh, butterfly, right? Uh, so, like I mentioned, you said that you have to take four photos, right, of the male and female, the yes. uh, the upper side and the underside. Maybe you could tell us how you did that because I'm still wondering how you 
managed to take the underside of the male and female. <laughs> oh yeah, it. okay. Um, generally, um, with butterflies, when they land on on the flower, usually the uh, you will be open, eh? be open, so you get the upper side. Um, but as uh, as mentioned, um, generally at rest, the butterflies will have their wings uh, upright. So you you see the underside. So now you can uh, take the photo, uh, take photos of the underside, right? Yeah. So when they first land, you take quickly take photos photos of the upper side, and before long you, they will close up and they, uh, you get the uh, the underside. But on um, Another another case is in the morning, uh, insects are not very active. So, so first of all, they need to, to warm up. So they will find a sunny spot and bask in the sunlight with their wings uh, open. So again, you see the upper side. Uh, so you have to start. Um, so butterflies will be active uh, from 8.45 so, uh, and on. Uh, and this is when you get to see butterflies with, with their wings uh, uh, open. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. We have a question. I, I have more, but there are a lot of there are quite a number of questions, mostly from the from our participants. Mm -hmm. First one is uh, from Yokmoi, Doctor Rosley. Which butterfly uh, field guide book for butterflies in this region would you recommend? Okay, okay. Um, um, with birds, it's very easy. You have uh, the field guide of uh, bird of Peninsular Malaysia. Um, so you buy that book, you get all the species, all the species uh, of bird in Peninsular Malaysia. Um, with butterflies, the one equivalent is, is the one I mentioned. Uh, uh, Forbet and Pendlebury, uh, the fifth edition, published 2020. Um, but rather than showing showing you live photos uh, of butterflies, photos uh, you know uh, captured in the captured alive, they show you uh, butterflies that are uh, that are mounted mounted butterflies. Eh? So the color is uh, generally uh, duller than uh, those light ones, uh, but they show you all the all the uh, butterflies available in Peninsula Malaysia. Mm. Um, but if you want um, a photograph of live butterflies, then you can use one book published in Singapore, uh, Butterflies of Singapore. But as I, I mentioned just now, only three butterflies in Singapore that are not available in, in the Peninsula of Malaysia. Yeah? Uh, they show you something like uh, 320 species. So uh, butterflies of Singapore, a field guide. So when they say field guide, it means that they show everything uh, in the country. Yeah? Uh, the author is a uh, uh, Q Sintun. He's Malaysian from Penang, uh, but he's in uh, he's the uh, butterfly expert um, in Singapore. Yeah? So you can you can you I, you can and should buy that too. Uh, published in 2015. Um, there is a butterflies of Peninsula Malaysia. Uh, Thailand and Singapore um, by Dr. Lawrence Curtin. Uh, this is a pocket book. It uh, shows uh, photos of uh, live butterflies. Um, 200 and, uh, 280 species. Uh, pretty good. Um, um, yeah. Um, so another book that uh, I use uh, is uh, Butterflies of Thailand. Um, many of the butterflies shown in that book is also uh, are also available in Peninsular Malaysia. Yeah? So butterflies of uh, Thailand 
the author is Pisus X E K dash Amnue uh, Amnue A M N U A Y. Uh, uh, introduction book um, is uh, Butterflies of Malaysia, if I'm not wrong, uh, by uh, Professor Emeritus Yong Hoi Sen. Uh, it's a bit old, 1983, but um, uh, it's okay. Um, introduction, uh, introduction to the butterflies of, of Malaysia, maybe Malaysia, yeah. Uh, 1983, Prof. Yong Hoi Sen. Mm, that's about, yeah, I think those are the main, uh, the main books. Uh, if you are willing to wait six months, uh, my book uh, will show about uh, 200, between 260 species to, to, to 280 uh, photo, uh, species, uh, photos, yeah? um, with my two co-authors, six months. <laughs> yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you, Rosie. There are a few more questions, but we are running a bit late. So we will, we, we will continue with the Q&A after Dr. Wahi's talk. Is that all okay. right, everyone? Yep. Okay. okay. So thank you, Rosalie. And I would also like to thank the audience for, 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 for the many questions that they've put in. And we hope that you keep them coming in the chat for the next Q&A session. Um, we are pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Wahi Zatul. Afzan Azmi, a senior lecturer with University of Malaysia, Trungano. Uh, her, research, her research area of specialization is entomology, insect biology, and ecology. Her current research activities are in vitro rearing of queen stingless bee and pollination ecology of the native stingless bees. I will now hand, it, hand over the session uh, to Wahid. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes sorry. Can. Okay, thank you very much, Lila, for a very nice introduction. Uh, my name is Wahi. Uh, today, I would like to share uh, some of my uh, current research, uh, especially on the pollination ecology of the stingless bees. So, I will share uh, my screen first. So can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, uh, all right. So um, today I would like to share uh, the title of my presentation is uh, The Importance, uh, Economic Value and the Challenges uh, in uh, Stingless Bee Pollination. So you can call me Wahi. <laughs> okay, sorry for the... Uh, noise around there. Okay, so today's uh, uh, presentation, uh, these are the outline of my presentation. So uh, I will briefly introduce uh, about what is stingless bee and then uh, their distribution uh, in this, uh, I mean, uh, for certain region. And then also some uh, common species that can be uh, found in Malaysia. And also what are their... Um, uh, ecological services or what are the importance of stingless bees and then uh, I will highlight uh, more on the pollination um, uh, I mean the why the stingless bees is very important for the pollination and then uh, some uh, studies uh, from my current research um, the efficiency of the stingless bees pollination how it uh, influenced uh, the quality of the crops and last but not least, uh, the challenges uh, of the stingless bee pollination uh, in our country. So um, as you can see here, uh, stingless bees are commonly known uh, in our country as kelulut. It is actually uh, the smallest honey, but they can produce uh, uh, the smallest honey producing bees. <clears throat> so they are very, very small. Um, uh, I think it's like a, a fly. Uh, size and the interesting part they don't have a functional sting uh, even though they are bees they don't have sting 
Okay, and uh, these uh, stingless bees, uh, they can be found uh, especially in tropical or subtropical regions uh, of the world. And they are very, very important uh, pollination agent, especially in tropical rainforests. And also, uh, they can, um, uh, they also uh, a very good uh, provide a uh, candidate uh, for the pollination services especially in agricultural ecosystem. So there are a lot of uh, studies or reports uh, that have um, uh, reported or revealed that uh, when we introduce the stingless bees in um, orchards like star fruits, mangoes, durian, watermelon, or guava, and coconut, it, uh, uh, the, the production or the fruit set has increased um, significantly. Okay, um, this map uh, shows uh, the distribution, the general distribution of stingless bees. Okay, if you look here, um, the distribution is uh, only restricted uh, in the, um, I mean, the, the row that have uh, highlighted with the red color. So meaning that uh, it only can be found uh, in a tropical and subtropical region. And their habitat, uh, very diverse. Uh, you can... Um, uh, find them in hollow trunks, tree branches, or even underground cavities, uh, especially in our uh, tropical rainforests or even in agriculture areas. So, um, uh, so far it has been estimated that uh, the species of stingless bees worldwide is around more than um, 500 species. Uh, and in Malaysia, amazingly, we have uh, around 45 species so far that can be found uh, in not only in Peninsula Malaysia, but also in um, Sabah and Sarawak. And uh, interestingly, uh, these um, uh, stingless bees, they have a very uh, unique and complex uh, nest architecture. Uh, if you look here, uh, these are uh, some examples of the uh, uh, the if you see here, this is actually uh, the main entrance of the um, nest of the stingless bees, and they are very very uh, unique and uh, a lot of variation, and you can find uh, their nest uh, as I said uh, either uh, uh, in hollow trunks, uh, tree branches, even uh, underground cavities, and some uh, stingless bees uh, they uh, use the termite nest uh, as their nest or rock crevices. Uh, but uh, we also can uh, find stingless bees uh, in our around in our buildings, huh? like uh, wall cavities like these, even in old rubbing be uh, rubbish bins, uh, water meters, uh, storage drums, uh, and many, many more. And they have a very unique, uh, very interesting forms and uh, always used as uh, their identification for the specific species. Uh, I would like to show uh, some of examples of the uh, the the nest entrance of uh, some of our native uh, stingless bees. Uh, this actually uh, photos taken uh, uh, from my final year students uh, about three or four years ago. Um, in Terengganu, we have uh, Indo Malayan. Uh, uh, repository uh, in uh, Sakayu, uh, but uh, I think uh, there's uh, more than uh, 50 uh, native species we call as Indomalaya uh, stainless bee. Uh, but unfortunately, um, this year we have a very, very, um, uh, what to say, um, uh, uh, uncontrolled um, flooded uh, flooding uh, is uh, is a very massive flood, and it destroys the repository and all the colonies that have been deposited there has been um, uh, collapsed or uh, damaged. So these are like some memories of the colonies that we have. Uh, uh, put there. For example, like this, uh, this is Tetrigona epicalis. Uh, this is their uh, main um, uh, nest entrance. Uh, it, it looks like a pad uh, that has a white uh, opening like this. Uh, this is Tetrigona peninsularis. They have a white opening, uh, but uh, uh, interestingly, their uh, uh, nest entrance is made uh, by the uh, damar or resin that can only be found in a very uh, specific uh, type of uh, uh, rainforest, especially in the primary rainforest. Huh? Like this is a uh, Tetrigona melanoluca, uh, and this is Lopo trigona canifrons. Uh, this is a very aggressive um, stingless bees. Huh? 
Uh, this is a very uh, beautiful um, nest entrance uh, from uh, Tetragonula repini. If you look here, uh, the, the nest entrance is like a ray of sun irradiating backward. And this is another interesting shape, uh, like sun shape uh, uh, from the other species, Tetragona cetarsis. Uh, this is Tetragona uh, uh, leviceps and uh, Tetragona uh, bingami. Uh, so meaning that uh, specific species have a uh, unique, uh, they have the uh, nest cavity um, entrance that are unique to the specific uh, species. So uh, now, um, uh, why stingless bees um, are very uh, interesting or um, important? Uh, what I can say is the advantages of uh, stingless bees, uh, especially in our rainforest ecosystem. First, um, they are polylacti, meaning that uh, they are pollination agent for many, many uh, type of uh, species of uh, plants uh, that can be found not only in rainforest, but also in, uh, in the agricultural ecosystem. And then uh, the other thing, uh, the uh, stingless bees, they are adaptability, means that they can be uh, easily adapted in a new uh, area. That's why um, it is very easy to domesticate or to culture them. And uh, also they uh, have uh, this uh, behavior floral fidelity, means that they are very, very, um, they know they are uh, territorial uh, and they uh, can, um, they have their specific uh, 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 territory for their food source. And that's why they are, they can, uh, they only forage in certain area. And as I said, uh, they are uh, easy to adapt, meaning that they can be uh, domesticated easily. And then uh, the other things uh, is a perennial colonies, meaning that uh, in one nest, uh, they can live together um, around 20,000 or 30,000 workers together with one queen and also uh, some individuals of drone. They can live uh, in uh, many, many, with many individuals uh, up to 10 years, uh, uh, some of them. So they can live um, uh, with uh, generations um, uh, and uh, they are what we call as uh, new social insects. Uh. And uh, the other thing is uh, they have a very large food reserves, it means that uh, they, um, their food source are very, very abundant and uh, they are very opportunists as long as there are a lot of um, flowering plants in the area. So uh, it is very easy to rear or to culture them in a very mass uh, colonies. So uh, I would like to show uh, some uh, general uh, external anatomy of the stingless bees. So this is the side view or the parallel uh, side of the uh, stingless bees. But uh, why uh, the important uh, structure or um, uh, anatomy that is very important uh, for pollinator is this one, uh, the hind leg. Huh? If you uh, notice, um, stingless bees, they have three pairs of uh, legs. Uh, so the hind legs, uh, uh, it's quite larger uh, compared with the uh, uh, fore leg and also middle leg. And there's a one structure we call as a pollen basket or carbocule. So this uh, structure, it is uh, actually function as a uh, to trap the pollen. So if you look here, like this is a stingless bees uh, visit uh, to uh, in, uh, at one flower. So this uh, this is the pollen lot a uh, load that is trapped uh, at uh, in, uh, at the pollen basket structure. So that's why uh, the pollinate uh, the stingless bees are very good uh, pollination agent because it has a good structure that can carry a uh, pollen load uh, when uh, it visits from one flower to another flower. The, uh, another interesting uh, 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 facts about the stingless bee is their mouth part. Eh? If you look here, um, they have uh, two types of mouth part. Uh, they have a mandible, meaning that they can uh, chew the pollen. Eh? They eat pollen as their protein source. And if you see here, this is actually their, um, this is the mandible. So this is their tongue, eh? you know, we call it as glossy. So the tongue is uh, like a um, straw meaning that they can uh, suck the nectar from the flower. So uh, it is very, it's quite long. Uh, uh, it's almost half of the body length. Uh, so when it rests, it will, um, uh, 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 I mean, uh, they will, uh, the, the, the glossy will be um, 
put inside the mouth. Eh? And the other uh, interesting uh, fact about stingless bees is about their uh, vision. Uh, their vision, uh, for example, like this, uh, this is human vision. Uh, we, we, uh, we see the flower is in yellow color, but uh, the stingless bees, uh, they can uh, detect the nectar. Uh, it is what we call as nectar guide. Uh. Uh, they, uh, what this is uh, how the bees uh, uh, see the flower. So this is um, because the uh, stingless bee, they can detect UV light. So uh, when the nectar is, uh, uh, I mean, the UV light, um, uh, 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 I mean, uh, the, ne uh, the, the nectar can, um, um, this is what we can, uh, put the vision of the bee uh, when it saw the, the flowers that have nectar, especially in this part, uh, in the middle. So it helps the bees to uh, select uh, which flowers have uh, reach of the nectar. So that's why they are good uh, in the pollination because they know uh, which flowers uh, can provide them a very good nectar um, to, for them. And uh, this is another interesting uh, structure that can be uh, found uh, at the uh, um, hind wing. This is what we call as hemuli. So it's like a, a hook that can uh, hook uh, the, the forewing so that they can fly together, uh, the uh, forewing and also the hind wing. Okay, um, uh, these are the list uh, of some examples of our native uh, stingless bees uh, that can be found in Malaysia. Uh, particularly in Peninsula Malaysia. Uh, just, uh, just want to highlight, uh, there are about uh, five species uh, that are commonly uh, domesticated uh, in our country. Uh, for the first one is, this is what you call as Heterotragona itama. So usually the stingless beekeeper, they will, uh, most of their stingless bees um, are from this uh, species. Uh, the next one is uh, Genotragona thoracica. This is also a very common uh, species uh, that uh, is uh, that can be found in our country, and it is considered as the largest stingless bees in Southeast Asia. And the next one is Tetragonula uh, fusco batiltia. Okay, this is uh, another species that can be used as pollination agent. The other one is Lepidotragona terminata, and the last one is Tetragonula uh, leviceps. Okay. So um, uh, as I said before, there are around 45 species uh, in Malaysia. And uh, for information, uh, the stingless bees uh, has been studied uh, since 1930 uh, by uh, European scientists, for example, like Schwarz, Michena, uh, Will, Will, Moore and Sakagami. So uh, most of them uh, have uh, described uh, our species and uh, that is uh, another, and we still have to describe more and more species because there's a lot of species that are unidentified. Okay, uh, now we go to the stingless bee pollination. So uh, what is pollination? Uh, generally, pollination is the transfer of pollen uh, from the anther. So pollen is actually from the male part of the flower. So if you look here, this is anther. So this is where we can find the pollen. Okay, and then uh, the transfer, meaning that uh, the pollen need to be transferred to the stigma. So the stigma is the female part of the flower. So when the pollen uh, uh, touch the stigma, the pollen uh, will um, move to the steel. So this is where the, the, the part where the uh, fertilization uh, happened, meaning that the ovule from the uh, female part will uh, fertilize with the um, pollen from the male part and it will produce um, the fruit. Eh? Uh, it will produce the fruit uh, or uh, this is uh, the offspring. So uh, this is uh, how the uh, stingless bees are actually helping uh, for the pollination process. Eh? So uh, for information, uh, insect pollinators, uh, they can uh, pollinate. Uh, there are, uh, I think, more than 80,000 of flowering plants uh, being pollinated by the insects. Eh? And uh, uh, insects, uh, especially the bees, they are very, very uh, uh, important, significant for the uh, pollination, especially for the angiosperm uh, plants. And that's why they are uh, an example of the uh, crucial or ecological services uh, for many, many different group of animals, especially the stingless bees, uh, which actually support many uh, lives uh, on earth by providing food and other resources. 
Okay, um, there are a lot of uh, reports uh, from previous studies that have revealed that uh, pollination of the stingless bees actually can affect uh, the fruits produced, especially for the cultivated uh, uh, crops. Uh. So if you look here, uh, these are the examples of the stingless bees that uh, visited uh, the flower. And um, interestingly, um, uh, there's a one paper from uh, Santos uh, et al. They reported that uh, cucumber pollination by the stingless bees um, uh, resulted in increasing of the fruit quantity and it has improved the quality of the uh, fruit produce. And then uh, another uh, report from Clark, uh, they uh, found that the bee pollinated strawberries the strawberries that have been pollinated by the stingless, stingless bees much heavier uh, and less malformed fruits and uh, they have higher commercial grades. Eh? And then uh, also uh, in other uh, reports from Cruz and also SLA. So uh, in general, it shows that uh, uh, positive um, impacts if we uh, introduce stingless bees in our uh, ecosystem. So uh, generally, as I said before, uh, pollinators are very important because it actually support the biodiversity. And uh, near uh, almost 90% uh, of uh, the uh, flowering plants, they benefit from the pollinator assisted pollination. And uh, only 20% uh, rely on wind pollination. Uh, so meaning that imagine if there's no insects, no pollination agent, so what happened to the other 90% of the flowering plants uh, in this world? Okay, And then 80% uh, 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 of the produce that uh, we actually depend on the pollinator assisted pollination, meaning that we need uh, these insects to to transfer the pollen from one flower to another flower because the pollen, some uh, plants, uh, they have a very heavy um, pollen and sticky pollen. Uh, so, um, uh, like if you notice, this is uh, the pollen of this flower. So, uh, it cannot be transferred or distributed by wind. It must be, uh, we need an agent uh, to, to, to transfer from one flower to another flower. And uh, for information, one in three bites that we, the food that we eat actually is from the insects pollination. Okay, uh, I just want to share uh, with all of you uh, one of my uh, studies uh, about um, the effect of pollination uh, by the stingless bees on the quality of the rock melon, uh, which uh, were grown in the greenhouse. So uh, from this study, we uh, found a very interesting outcome where it proves that uh, stingless bees actually can improve the, the quality of the crops. Eh? So uh, that's why we need uh, to make sure that um, we, um, we conserve, uh, we make sure that the, the stingless bees uh, can be um, uh, abundant in our ecosystem. Uh, so in this study, uh, we choose uh, heterotergonite tama as the uh, pollination agent in the experiment. Uh, because this is uh, the most common, the most abundant stingless bees uh, that can be easily um, uh, found in our country. And uh, as I said, uh, they have a, a modified hind leg, which is uh, the pollen basket, which is uh, important for the pollination pro uh, process. And um, also, um, uh, these uh, species, they have a resistance in disease and parasites. And that's why it's... Uh, uh, the uh, the stingless beekeeper they prefer to to culture or to rear this uh, species. Eh? So why I choose uh, these crops? Uh, because uh, it is um, uh, one of the most commercialized uh, commercial crop in Malaysia. And then the other thing is about their characters of the flowers. Uh, we call it as monoecious flower, meaning that they have a female flower and male flower. It is separated. So, uh, meaning that um, uh, the male flower, uh, we, uh, the pollen can be uh, found in male flower and then the female, it will uh, transform to be the fruit like this. But uh, the female flower needs the pollen from the male flower, meaning that these crops, they are crucially, they are, uh, uh, I mean, they really need pollination agent to make sure that this female can develop to be uh, this fruit, eh, the rock melon. 
Okay, so um, uh, usually in Malaysia, uh, uh, especially in um, uh, for the for the farmers that um, uh, grow this uh, crop in a very uh, huge uh, or mass culture, they usually uh, cultivate this uh, crop in greenhouse. So greenhouse means it's enclosed. Right? So it's very, uh, it actually hindered uh, the, the pollination agent to help for the process. So uh, they use, they usually they use or uh, they hire labor uh, or um, uh, worker to do the pollination, uh, but it is manual. So meaning that uh, the worker will take the male flower, they, they will uh, rub the male flower on the female flower, and then th this is how we uh, see it as manual pollination. Human do the pollination. Eh? So uh, uh, in this experiment, uh, we did three uh, different treatments. Uh, the first one is as uh, act as control, meaning that there's no um, stingless bees. Uh, we just let it be, nothing. Uh, we don't do anything here. Uh, the next one, hand cross pollination, where we uh, did the pollination manually. So this is uh, the current practice uh, used by the farmers. And the next one is uh, we introduce uh, two colonies in this uh, section, uh, the heterotragonic itama colonies. So meaning that the pollination uh, will be uh, done by these uh, stingless bees. Eh? So this is the process, uh, the greenhouse procedure. So it's a normal process to grow the rock melon. But the important thing is uh, we have to make sure when is the emphasis time, meaning that when is the flower will uh, flowering or blooming. So usually we, or, uh, we will introduce the stingless bees uh, at least two days before the pollination day, okay, uh, to make sure that the, the bees uh, will adapt uh, with the greenhouse uh, surrounding. So um, this uh, usually the, uh, the emphasis or the flowering period, uh, it takes around two weeks. Huh? So meaning that uh, the stingless bees uh, only um, can, uh, we only put the stingless bees colonies for two weeks, not uh, the whole uh, cycle of the rock melon. And then we take out the colonies because they need um, um, varieties of food source, not only depend on the rock melon. Huh? So uh, we don't want the colony to be collapsed. Huh? So that uh, and then uh, we uh, we harvest we harvested the 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 uh, the fruits to compare uh, the quality. So basically, this is how we did. Uh, this is the self pollination. This is the stingless bee pollination. So we will check uh, which uh, uh, flowers that have been visited or pollinated by the bees, and this is how we did the uh, hand cross pollination. Okay, sorry, this is not rock melon flower, but just to show how we did the, the process. So after we harvested the, uh, the fruits, we did some uh, measurement, uh, like uh, we uh, measured the weight, the diameter, the diameter, length, and so on, to compare uh, the differences between the treatments. So I have uh, uh, published uh, the findings in this uh, journal. Okay, uh, but um, if you, I'm sorry if it's not very clear, but uh, from the results, uh, we found that uh, the rock melon produced from plants that pollinated by stingless bees and hand cross pollination have uh, uh, a higher fruit set, heavier and larger and contain higher number of seeds uh, compared with the self-pollination, uh, uh, meaning that there's no difference, no significant difference between hand cross uh, and also stingless bees it produced the same quality. Uh, but the interesting part, uh, we, not, uh, we found that the pollination by stingless bees uh, produced fruit with greater sweetness uh, compared with other treatments. So uh, this study has uh, clearly showed that uh, uh, when we introduce the stingless bees in our uh, orchard or in the uh, uh, um, plantation, it actually uh, give uh, the impact or the um, uh, the quality of the crops uh, to be much better. For example, like the rock melon, uh, it's uh, produce a higher, uh, better quality of rock melon with better yields uh, compared with other uh, treatments. Eh? So it shows that uh, our native stingless bees could be considered as an alternative effective pollinator to improve uh, the production of the rock melon, especially in the greenhouse cultivation. Okay, uh, now uh, the challenges. Huh? Uh, for your information, our stingless bees are struggling. 
uh, this is due to the loss of habitat. Uh, we know that most of our forests uh, has been cleared or deforested uh, due to, of course, we, we need um, uh, pembangunan, but it actually destroyed their natural habitats. Huh? As I uh, showed before, they can be found in hollow trunks, in uh, branches, even in the uh, ground and so on. And then lack of food, huh? meaning that the flowering plants, that's why we need to help them uh, in order to survive. Uh, they, we, they need the flowering plants and also the use of pesticides, huh? uh, the toxic chemicals, because timus bees, they are very sensitive to, to the chemicals. Huh? And um, due to that, especially the farmers, they 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 prefer to 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 spray the pesticides. Meaning that they uh, of course they targeted the the pest, but actually when uh, we use uh, uh, pesticide without control, we actually kill untarget species, especially the beneficial one uh, like the stingless bees. Huh? So uh, we uh, actually, uh, uh, when uh, I did the knowledge transfer program, I always uh, advise or try to uh, make the uh, beekeepers, especially the farmers, uh, to think uh, natural, meaning that try to uh, less use of the pesticides uh, and then um, uh, die, uh, plant very diverse plants because usually uh, the bees, they need uh, a diverse uh, of the plants as their food source and then keep the living roots in it, keep the soil covered and to make sure that the ecosystems are healthy. And the other thing about the stingless bees in our country, uh, as you can see here in this picture, this actually the lock, uh, we call it as lock, uh, lock kelulut. Eh? Uh, this is what we uh, is very sad eh? uh, because most of the stingless beekeepers they uh, get uh, the lock from the rainforest. They do the what we call as hunting uh, uh, wild stingless bees. So meaning that they have cleared the forest, they cut the forest uh, uh, in order to get the wild colonies. So uh, of course we know that they want to um, to do. Uh, uh, to mass culture to get uh, more uh, colonies for the production of honey and so on. But actually, they have destroyed the natural habitats, not only for the um, uh, other insects, but actually other organisms that depends on these uh, uh, trees. Huh? So we need to protect uh, the wild habitat uh, and especially the host plants of the stingless bees. And that's why uh, when I did the uh, knowledge transfer program, we try to uh, advise, to encourage the beekeepers to do the, um, what you call as, um, to multiply their colonies by doing, um, uh, not to cut down, but we can do it, uh, uh, manually. Uh, and one of the research that I currently uh, conducted now is used uh, by uh, using the in vitro queen, uh, meaning that uh, I uh, uh, the, the beekeepers, they want to multiply the colonies. They need the, the queen because one colony uh, need one queen. So uh, they don't have to, to cut down the trees. So that's why I'm trying to help the beekeepers uh, by uh, produce the queen in the lab and then they can uh, uh, introduce in the field so that they can have more colonies without uh, uh, doing the log hunting that can, of course, destroy our rainforest. So uh, this is my last slide. Uh, as a conclusion, um, uh, what uh, I'm trying to say that uh, we need to make sure that the habitat is back, uh, the biodiversity above the ground, meaning that. So uh, the plant pesticide, um, meaning that uh, we, um, uh, uh, we try to... Um, uh, to advise or to to make our farmers to understand that they need to to try to reduce the use of the pesticide they can actually uh, encourage the natural enemies by uh, 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 you know like um, initiate free bushes or trees but and these bushes and trees actually the uh, natural habitat for the natural uh, the uh, natural enemies to the certain uh, pests, so they don't have to depend too much on the pesticide, uh, but do the integrated uh, pest management, which is the best practice. Eh? And then the other thing that uh, we we also advise them to leave some open soil under bushes and trees. It's like shelter uh, for the bees uh, and also for other uh, pollinators. And then uh, place birds, bats, and bees houses. This is another way to uh, encourage uh, the pollination uh, agent upon uh, the pollinators' natural habitat. So, because if we um, 
um, initiate or we create uh, shelters for the stingless bees, we actually can um, multiply the colonies indirectly huh? and then plant in, uh, organic fruit uh, producing plants, uh, plant organic native uh, wildflowers uh, that can bloom at different time uh, during the growing season. Uh, this is to make sure that the food reserves is continuously so that uh, the, the beekeepers can be sustained in that specific area. And the last but not least, we have to provide a water source because the water is also important for the uh, stingless bees to survive. Eh? Uh, that's all from me. I hope that um, all of you can gain or obtain some um, information from my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Wahi. Such an interesting uh, presentation. And I think a lot of us have learned a lot about both butterflies and stingless bees. Um, we will we'll have a short session. There are quite a number of questions for you, Dr. Wahi. Uh, we will uh, ask you a few questions and then I will jump between Rosalie and you. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, before we start the Q&A, uh, uh, could we uh, take photographs of all the participants if everyone could turn on their video? Dohi, can you just put down your uh, slides for now? Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to wait for another 10 seconds. All right. Nice All right. Okay. Smile, everybody. One more time. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. We'll start the questions now. So, Dr. Wahi, the first question is um, a, a similar question, actually. Is there any identification guidebook or website for stingless bees of Malaysia? Okay, uh, yes. Uh, there are a lot of uh, identification books, uh, um, but for specific for Malaysia, there are, I think uh, uh, one of the publications is from Mardi. Uh, and then uh, we also, uh, from our university, uh, from UMT, uh, we have our colleague that also very actively produce uh, books uh, uh, like uh, my friend, uh, Prof. Samso, uh, he is very active doing the publication, especially with the general audience, uh, especially on native stingless bees and also native bees. And uh, I think there's a lot of website. And then uh, we have a lot of uh, beekeepers that also um, have um, uh, publications, uh, not only uh, uh, on like guidebooks, but also like... Um, posters or um, websites and if you google uh, you can I think you can easily find them uh, but uh, if you want to have a very specific uh, guidebook uh, you can just uh, personal uh, contact me uh, I can help you okay thank you Wahi next question do the stingless bee colonies fight with each other to conquer their own feeding area Yes, yes. Uh, they also compete uh, or fight to each other. That's why uh, if you uh, want to rare uh, the colonies, for example, for hundreds or maybe up to 20, you need to know the distance uh, from one colony to one colony. So uh, uh, usually the Jabatan Pertanian, they have the uh, the procedure, uh, they have the methods uh, how to rare, uh, to culture the bees in a huge number of colonies. So uh, that's why you have to make sure that um, there are, uh, I can't remember the distance between one colony to co one colony because uh, even though they are similar species, but they uh, also compete uh, to get uh, especially the food source. So sometimes if uh, the fighting or the competition is very, uh, you know, um, uh, serious, it can make uh, both colonies 
to abscond, uh, absconding. So that's why we need to understand uh, to, to, to make sure that uh, to locate uh, the colonies in the right position uh, so that there's uh, no uh, fighting between the colonies. Yeah. Okay. So you, you actually have to be very careful when you have, if you're yeah. having nests in your gardens, you have to be very careful about yes. how you place them and all that. That's true. But, mm -hmm. All right. Uh, next question. If the queen dies early, what happens to the colony? Okay. Uh, uh, usually, uh, the queen dies uh, because of certain reason. Um, the queens, they can live uh, up to three to five years. Then uh, they, are, they are not productive anymore, meaning that uh, they cannot produce the eggs. So usually, in one colony, um, there will be a potential queen. Uh, so when the queen uh, kind of what we can say is like menopause uh, is not productive um, anymore meaning that they cannot produce the eggs uh, uh, like uh, before so the workers they can um, they have the sense uh, the workers they have the sense that their queen is no longer productive and uh, sometimes they will uh, kill they will kill uh, the uh, the old queen and then the new queen that has uh, the potential queen will take over the colony, and uh, uh, that is the natural that that's the natural behavior that happened in one colony because the uh, the queen need to need to be replaced with the new queen. Okay, and if the queens um so, sometimes uh, uh, the queens dies uh, without um. Maybe it's because of the uh, attack or competition whatsoever. So usually uh, the workers, uh, they will find another colony. Or uh, the other thing is um, uh, the workers might, um, this is what happened if the, the queen is old, uh, the workers will produce the eggs. This is not good. Uh, meaning that there's no uh, pheromone that can control uh, the production of the eggs because uh, only queen can produce the viable eggs, meaning that uh, the eggs will develop to be workers. If the workers, um, um, I mean, uh, they, they lay the eggs, it will not be um, female workers. It will be male workers that is uh, sterile, mandul. So uh, it's very rare. Uh, that is the, the, the behavior. That's why uh, usually uh, if the queen will, uh, uh, I mean, there's um, the period of the queen is uh, uh, almost ended, it will re be replaced with another new queen. So uh, that, that is interesting uh, about the social insects. Um, so it, it is naturally be, will be replaced. I hope that I can answer that. Okay, so the colony will sustain because the, the new queen will take over. Okay. Okay. Next <laughs> question. Uh, this there are about three quest three questions. So I'll do it one by one. Okay. Are black soldier flies yes. mm -hmm. a big problem for stingless bee colony colonies yes. cultivated mm -hmm. and wild in Malaysia? All right. Okay. Uh, uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, this is um, the common pest of the stingless bees. We call it as uh, black soldier flies, uh, BSF. But actually, BSF is very important in our ecosystem. They are the decomposer uh, for the organic matter. So they can be found naturally in our ecosystem. But uh, for the industry of the stingless bees, uh, they are like they are not good for the stingless bees because when the BSF or black soldier flies attack the colony, it will uh, it will be total loss because the larvae uh, uh, will take over, will dominate the colonies, and the whole logs will be collapsed. Eh? So in while um, um, if in wild, I think it's not a problem because uh, BSF is important also for our ecosystem. But uh, if uh, in, um, in a farm that have uh, hundreds of colonies, it will be a disaster. Okay. And uh, uh, that's why uh, I think until now, uh, there's a no uh, specific uh, practice to, or I mean, um, um, control method uh, to make sure that the black soldier flies did not attack uh, the colonies. But usually the beekeepers will um, uh, try to reduce 
to attack, meaning that they will uh, make sure that the their colonies is uh, in a good condition, uh, uh, meaning that uh, uh, I, I notice usually the colonies uh, from law, uh, from the law, it is easy to attack. But if the colonies is in the, in the box, it is uh, very rare to attack by the uh, BSF because the BSF, uh, the, the flies, uh, the female, uh, I think in their life cycle, they only lay eggs two times in their life cycle. So they will lay the eggs uh, in the crevices, uh, the, the, especially the, the, the lock. So it's very hard to, to detect the tiny eggs. Huh? So once the eggs hatch, the larvae will uh, crawling and go inside uh, the locks, which is uh, we cannot see what happened inside the locks. And this is where the, the larvae will consume uh, the, the honey, the pollen, everything, the food source, and it will attack them, uh, do the a massive attack. So, uh, so far... Um, what is the question? The beekeepers uh, that I noticed, they they they, uh, they will do trap uh, to, I mean, uh, the trap that to attract the BSF, but there's no specific uh, control method to uh, reduce the BSF, just to make sure that their uh, farms in a, uh, in a hygiene uh, or in a uh, very good condition that uh, try to reduce the breeding site of the BSF uh, to make sure that the, the area is in a uh, not too clean because if it's too clean, you cannot uh, attract. Uh, I mean, uh, we need the natural uh, behavior, uh, I mean, the habitat for the stingless bees, but just to make sure there's no um, uh, um, food source or organic matter that can attract uh, the BSF. Uh, I hope that um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I can answer that, but, but it's a very hard, tough to control this pest. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 because you, you have mentioned about how much is known about this problem but one yeah. more is you also mentioned beekeepers but just in case any mm. feedback from the beekeepers tr uh, throughout your knowledge transfer program on this about the problems that they faced okay I think uh, you have actually that. covered it <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay yeah. but it's okay you can contact me uh, in personal uh, I mean the Akila from UTHM Okay. Yeah. Uh, or you want me to try to answer? Uh. Uh, if you if you if you want to answer, go ahead. We'll okay. Be quite uh, happy. Uh, okay. So far, uh, as I said, uh, it depends on the area. Uh, if the area, uh, if the uh, the the meliponiary or the beekeeping area is very close to, um, especially to the poultry site uh, where you can, uh, there's a uh, chicken. Uh, I mean, the, there's a residential area. There's a, a, a farm of chicken. So it is um, actually uh, one of the factors why the BSF is very abundant at that area. And then uh, the sense, uh, uh, the uh, actually the the honey produced uh, by the uh, stingless bees, they have um, uh, what we say the smell that can attract uh, the BSF. So BSF they like. Um, the uh, the sugary or fermentation uh, of the organic matter that is very strong so it's uh, actually can attract more bsf so that's why um especially during um uh, um i think it's kemarau it's very hot it will uh, produce a lot of uh, uh, you know smell that can attract bsf and usually the beekeepers they will try to uh, they will make it manually lah. Huh? They, if they saw, they will check manually their uh, uh, colonies. If they notice they are attacked by BSF, they will uh, open the colonies. They will cut uh, the 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 damaged area and they will secure and save the 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 uh, the part of the colonies and they will move to another box so that they can reduce uh, the attack. There's no total loss. The, that's why the beekeepers will always alert. Uh, with their colonies, if they notice the the stingless bees is no act, not active, uh, you can see uh, the behavior. If the bees is not active, and then uh, they so there's a certain sign and symptom uh, from the uh, from the what we say um, from the box uh, from the um, topping. Usually we call topping. So uh, there's something wrong about the colonies. So usually the beekeepers they will cut uh, the lock, the internal the the trunk. 
and then they will uh, take out the damaged uh, area and they will they receive uh, the area that is not uh, attacked by the BSF and put another box. That is the, the practice that they make so far. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Um, I think we'll give uh, Wahi a bit of a rest and we'll go to uh, Rosli. Can I ask a few a question? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, this is a question. Uh, he asked, the 1,000 species of butterflies were counted in which years? And how many species have gone extinct over the past 50 years? Uh, okay, I think uh, the figure uh, mentioned to be exact, I guess, is uh, 1,051 for Malaysia and Singapore. Uh -huh. uh, this this is uh, the list of uh, butterfly species um, right from whenever the result um, has been published, for example, from the days of uh, Alfred Russell Wallace uh, until um, until the present the present day. Uh, so these are the list of butterflies that people have, uh, well, scientists uh, mostly uh, have uh, recorded in Peninsula Malaysia in, and Singapore. Um, so not not in any particular year. Um, I can't. Uh, I can't tell offhand um, which of the species have gone um, extinct uh, in the last 50 years. Um, definitely not uh, in Peninsula Malaysia and Singapore. Well, Singapore, probably they, they know um, those species that, uh, that have not been recorded because um, um, they have uh, not recorded nearly half of, of the species that were seen uh, years and years ago. Eh? Um, but it, um, it's not an easy thing to declare uh, a species as extinct. Um, first, especially like birds, uh, um, um, there is a st very strict criteria. It's not like uh, you have not seen it for the last 10 years and therefore uh, you, you say it is extinct. Uh, some birds uh, uh, have not been seen for 70 years and suddenly reappear. So, so when you look at uh, the number of uh, birds or butterflies or whatever uh, and say these uh, have gone extinct, uh, these this uh, record have really gone through uh, a very rigorous uh, process. And, and so when you see that, oh, there, there, there are very few species uh, that have gone extinct. Ah, but then, like I said, um, even if a species have not been seen for uh, like 70 years, you still can't officially uh, record the species as, as extinct. Yeah? So don't be fooled by the fact that there are very few species declared as extinct and therefore you say, oh, no worries. Uh, very few uh, uh, butterflies or birds um, have gone extinct. Yeah, um, yeah but um, I can't tell offhand uh, which butterflies uh, that have been recorded as, as, as extinct. Um, we in Peninsula, in, in Malaysia, we need to do a lot more research on, on, on say, the decline of uh, butterflies. And as uh, Dr. Wahi uh, was telling us about uh, the, the Kelulut, um, we need more people to research on Kelulut and whatever else. Yeah? <clears throat> uh, more of this type of research has been, um, uh, has been done in, in, in the West, of course, uh, Britain and uh, the US and so on. And, and like I said, uh, Britain only has 58 species. It's not, it's not that difficult to uh, keep track. Yeah? Uh, our species, especially those um, in the rainforest, um, uh, there are many species, but there are uh, very few individuals, not easy to, to get hold of them. Eh? 
So, oh yeah, in short, um, I can't uh, tell offhand what are the species that uh, have gone extinct. <clears throat> okay. Um, next question, Rosli. Can you please explain the Malay names for butterflies uh, sl slash moth, Kerkupu and Rarama? Okay. Um, okay, the Malay names are only for butterflies. Um, I think uh, in Malay it is a uh, kupu kupu, although uh, my I, I thought the uh, uh, rama rama is uh, for butterflies, but I think officially uh, rama rama is for moth and kupu kupu is for is for butterflies. Um, okay, what we did one is a uh, an adapt adaptation of the English names. But we would like to claim we did something uh, to give more information uh, to the Malay name compared to the English name. Now, for example, if you see uh, two names eh, uh, of butterflies, Painted Lady and Indian Red Admiral. Now, you would think uh, there, are no, there are no relationship between them. But when you look at the scientific name, both are of the both are of the genus Vanessa. So what we did was um, we named um, in the Malay name by group, subgroup, and the species name. So for for the two uh, butterflies mentioned, we choose the group name as Laxmana after the after the Indian Red Admiral. Eh? So the first one is um, Laxmana Bersole, the painted lady. And the other one is uh, just, uh, just a direct translation, Laxmana, Laxmana India Mera. So by, by, by using a group name for the two butterflies, Laxmana, now you know that the two are, are related. Um, so the same thing we did with uh, this um, this group of butterflies uh, under the genus genus Graphium. Now, all the names again, as if you look at the English names of the of uh, of that group, uh, some uh, some uh, tail J, some uh, swat tail, uh, five five bar swat tail, uh, lesser zebra. Again, you don't see the connection. So <clears throat> we use the the group name of Riam for for the whole uh, butterflies in that in that uh, in that genus. Eh? So the genus of Graphium. So you have uh, like uh, Riam berekor, and for the swat tail as Riam um, ekor pedang jalur lima. So in many of the Malay names, there are three. Three, three names, three subnames, the, the group name, subgroup name, subgroup name, and the species name. So, so we would like to think we have contributed um, by using this uh, group concept that people can see immediately that ah, all these uh, these all uh, all these butterflies are related to each other by having the same uh, genus. <clears throat> Um, why can't the English names uh, be done like that? Because all the English names have been used for hundred, for something like two hundred years, so people are used to it. You, know, you can't suddenly change the uh, painted lady to um, uh, Admiral Painted Lady. Uh, yeah? People people just won't 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 buy it. Um, so in a way, it's good when you you jump into the game late. You can you know use the the latest. Um, latest uh, knowledge about uh, about uh, butterflies. Uh, yes, so only only Malay names for butterflies, none, not not yet, and I don't think I'll ever do it for moth. Like I said, uh, there are 10 times more moth species than uh, butterflies, and butterflies already giving me a lot of headaches. Okay, Lila? Yeah, next question, and then we'll go back to Dr. Wahi. Are the toxic things in butterflies dangerous to us? I think that's for me too, isn't it? 
Sorry? Uh, that's, for you, question... that's for you. That's for you. Yes. Okay. Um, I guess anything toxic to, to, to birds and other animals would be toxic to us too. But because uh, we have a larger uh, body mass, uh, so those that can kill uh, birds for eating the butterflies um, may only cause us a severe diarrhea, but um, probably nothing more than that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Wahi, uh, the question is, uh, can we apply this method, stingless bee pollination, to all kinds of fruits or, fruit or food and get better results than the natural way of pollination? Yes, yes, definitely. I think there are more than, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the list uh, from the uh, crops, uh, there are more than 30 species of crops that are uh, benefited, benefited from the uh, pollination of the stingless bees. And uh, some of the uh, feedback that we get from uh, uh, of the farmers, uh, they say that when they uh, read uh, the stingless bees in their uh, area or in the farms, they can um, uh, uh, what is it? The the fruit set, uh, the fruits, uh, especially for example, like the mangoes, huh? uh, it uh, produce one hundred percent of the fruit set. Uh, set if the uh, stingless bees are uh, cultured or red in the area, and also uh, with the coconuts, uh, belimbing, star fruits, and many more, many more, many many more of the crops. Huh? So even though it's not a uh, scientific evidence. But the feedback uh, from the beekeepers are very uh, uh, positive because uh, the stingless bees are helping uh, their yield, uh, the production of the crops. Uh. Uh, but uh, if uh, there's one thing, uh, if you want to put uh, uh, stingless bees, you have to make sure that you apply the pesticide uh, not uh, during their active uh, foraging time. So this is what I advise uh, for the beekeepers. Uh, uh, for example, we know that uh, some farmers, uh, they, pre they have uh, the schedule to apply their pesticide, uh, especially on the crops like chili, I think uh, one or two times per day. So uh, what I um, advise to them, uh, try to not to apply the pesticide uh, during 9 to 11 a.m. because this is the time when uh, the flower is uh, blooming or antithesis and this is when the time the stingless bees or pollination agent are actively forage. So when they uh, apply the, the pesticide, uh, it uh, of course definitely it will kill all these beneficial insects. Huh? So uh, this is another thing that uh, the 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 farmers need to, uh, try to to change their um, routine uh, if they want to uh, integrate uh, the pollination in their farms. Uh, try to reduce the the, the uh, is a pesticide and know when to apply. Uh, this is a uh, thing that I I think is very important. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Wahi. And then one more. Are any local universities conducting stingless beekeeping workshops for the public? Yes, I think uh, we, uh, uh, UMT, we have uh, conducted, uh, I think, more than three times of the uh, seminar as well as the workshops uh, of the stingless beekeeping. And uh, besides uh, universities, there are some uh, 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 beekeepers uh, societies, especially in uh, certain states like Kelantan, Terengganu, even in Johor, they have a very active uh, societies that they uh, conduct the beekeeping workshops, I think, every year. So uh, definitely, uh, it's actually it's a common uh, workshop and uh, not only uh, by universities, but other societies as well. Uh, so uh, I can share if we, I think um, usually every year uh, we uh, in UMT, we have a seminar, uh, like engagement with the beekeepers or other uh, uh, audience that interested with stingless bees. So maybe I can uh, pass to Lila and then Lila can. Yes. Uh, you, uh, yes. But uh, uh, probably this year we try to have uh, one uh, workshop. Uh, on the in vitro queen of stingless bees. So I, I'm trying to organize this workshop. So uh, if you're interested, you can join uh, maybe at the end of this year. Okay. okay. Please keep us informed. 
Dr. Wahi. Dr. Wahi, Vidyan, from what you say, I mean, from, from our session today, we're now beginning to realize the importance of the stingless bees when you talk about pollination of crops and all that. But at the same time, they also play a very important role in the jungle, right, in the forest. And for many uh, people, like you mentioned, hunting is also a problem for these bees. How do we balance it? I know one of the methods you said was that you're now trying to do uh, grow the, the queen bee in the labs, right? But what else can we do? Because has more and more people uh, find out how good they are? Because you're talking about crops, you're talking about commercial farming and uh, fruit trees and everything. How do we make sure that uh, there's still a viable uh, population in the forest and also that the forest is not affected? I think you're on mute. Sorry, I forgot to admit. Okay, uh, this is a very tough question, Leila. Uh, we know that um, our country is uh, encouraging uh, this industry, which actually um, indirectly uh, encourage more of log hunting. So that is the current practice uh, by most of our farmers where they do the cutting of trees, uh, a lot of uh, activities just to get the wild colonies. So um, that's why um, we try to educate uh, even the sometimes the government agencies also, they want to do kind of um, um, helping the community to increase their income. But the way, uh, the, I mean, uh, to, to get the source from the natural uh, habitat, like cutting the trees is not um, the best practice. So that's why, um, uh, I know it's very, I, I even cannot um, answer, uh, I don't know how to say it, but uh, but um, when we did workshop, um, honestly, we also have logs uh, in our farms, but we also um, uh, try to, to show to them, but actually they can um, multiply the colonies by trapping. There's a lot of uh, uh, methods, eh? not only... Uh, uh, find the active colonies and then split into two colonies. That is uh, the one method. And then the method is uh, do the trapping where they can put um, like a trap that we usually put honey, we look, put propolis and certain um, materials. And then the wild workers or wild stingless bees will be attracted with the trap. And after a few days, after a few months, it will be um, stable. And that one, it will be one new colony. But it takes time. Uh, it may be about three to four months to get a, a very uh, stable colony by doing the passive trapping. Uh, the, so um, uh, the best way to educate them is to let them to understand what happened if the trees are, uh, I mean, uh, the trees are cutting and we lost the natural habitat. So um, we have to, to show to them, we know that lately we have a lot of uh, disasters due to the deforestation, uh, like the landslide, uh, the floods, and many, many more. So we can relate that. If you want to log hunting, this is what happened. It will not only reduce uh, the population of the stingless bees, but it will affect uh, the whole ecosystem of the rainforest and the impact is to human. Uh, so um, that's why uh, it's very hard, especially to educate the audience that only think about money. <laughs> Some of them, they only think about uh, how to get, how to harvest honey, how to get production more, how to get, uh, you know, um, uh, profits and anything. So, uh, it's very hard actually, especially those who cannot um, understand about the, the importance of our uh, forests and our ecosystem. So we, as um, researchers, we need to find uh, innovations or methods that, uh, that is faster, that is um, practical to be applied by the beekeepers uh, to multiply the colony. And one of them is uh, by introducing queen. That is the the uh, upper, 
the 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 research that um the beekeepers are uh, uh, currently trying to get from me uh, because they know the queen is uh, the important component to to the colony in order to survive so um uh, that i hope that i can answer that alila uh, it's not very easy to educate uh the beekeepers that uh that are very uh, strong or a very focused, you know, uh, just to get the honey for their profit. But we try, we try our best uh, to find alternative or other ways to multiply the colonies, not just depend 100% on the wild logs. So that's, <laughs> I hope that uh, answers that question. <laughs> Uh, can I uh, can I ask Dr. Wahid because uh, I've been buying uh, I've been buying a uh, kalulot uh, uh, honey. Other other kalulot honey that have been adulterated with sugar. I'm worried about that. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Um, sadly, yes. I I heard there are some reports. Uh, the the honey uh, has been um, it's not genuine anymore and some of the beekeepers they mix with water and some of them they put uh, honey uh, I mean um, you know like sugars and it yeah, and many many more so it's very hard to to control this and uh, to tell the truth is already there uh, but uh, that's why we encourage uh, the Cause uh, the consumers to find the the right um, source, especially direct from the beekeepers or the reliable um, uh, seller. Okay, uh, Doctor Rosli. <laughs> yeah. Um, we... Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> One more yeah. question. Um, I have my own clulut nest in my garden, but my clulut uh, uh, honey is dark. Uh, all the others that I've been buying. They are lightly colored. So, what's happening? You mean the color of the honey? Yes, uh, it's dark. Okay. All right. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Eh? Okay. Uh, actually, the, the color of honey is, there's a lot of variation. Eh? You can find a very, uh, some of the honey is very dark, right? Some of the honey color uh, is uh, very uh, dull, uh, yellow, orange. Some of them, uh, I, I, I have a taste before this is a purple or pink color. So actually, it depends on the flowers that the stingless bees visited. Uh, some of the honey we call as multifloral honey, meaning that uh, the stingless bees visited more than one type of uh, plant. Uh, so that's why the combination of many pollen collected uh, or nectar from many different species of the flowers uh, produce a very unique color of the honey. Uh, if uh, the honey come from um, unifloral, it mean, means that only one uh, dominant um, vegetation. So it can be said uh, it's a unifloral honey and it reflect the color of the honey. Uh, I have uh, uh, a lot of collection of honey and we can see sometimes, for example, like gelam honey, uh, like uh, honey from the rainforest, honey from the farm, from the, uh, you know, from the housing area is different because uh, as I said, the color of the honey, uh, it depends to many factors. One of the factors is on the, uh, the, the, the plants or the botanical origin of the um, the honey, uh, and then the other thing is uh, if the honey is uh, stored uh, for uh, many, uh, I mean for the duration is long, uh, the color will turn into darker and darker. Uh, that's it. Another, it's not fresh anymore. So there's a lot of uh, factors, but definitely the botanical origin or the plants that uh, were visited by the stingless bees uh, influence the color of the honey and also the taste and the aroma and many, many more. Uh, that is the interesting Thank part. Wow. Right. Thank you, Rahi. I think we've asked you uh, many questions and you can see how uh, interested people are in the stingless bees. Um, last two questions. Uh, both are for... Rosalie, 
are the names in Malay for butterflies that Dr. Rosley mentioned a consensus or collaborative work with Brunei and Indonesia? Uh, no, at the moment, um, uh, um, with my two collaborators, we are working with um, um, with uh, my bees. Um, this is a biodiversity integrated system under the Ministry of uh, Technology and uh, uh, Natural Resources. So I think Lila mentioned in the beginning that um, that ministry is uh, in the process of publishing our book. Mm, uh, so one of the component of the of the book is um, this uh, checklist. So the checklist checklist of the uh, butterflies of Peninsular Malaysia and Singapore. So we have uh, the scientific name checklist from from Corbett and Pendlebury. Then the English names uh, from the same book, and also other books because uh, Corbett and Pendlebury only gave uh, limited uh, English names. And then the third checklist is the Malay name. So, uh, so it's under, under the under my beast, under the Kementerian, yeah? uh, but no collaboration with uh, Brunei and and Indonesia yet. Let's get the the Malay checklist, uh, you know, right first before collaborating with uh, with the others. Yeah. <clears throat> would Brunei and Indonesia uh, would there would there be people in Brunei and Indonesia working on names as well? In... Uh, I have no idea uh, at the moment, but uh, once we get the checklist, the Malay checklist uh, done, uh, maybe my piece or the Kementerian can uh, you know, get in touch with Brunei and uh, Indonesia. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question, Rosalie. Some moths are day flying moths, right? How to differentiate them between uh, butterflies? that we know has diurnal creatures? Okay, um, if you look at the day flying moths, uh, especially, the, especially the tiger moth, um, from afar, you would think that uh, they are butterflies. Um, initially, when I was um, uh, into butterflies, um, I was confused also. But uh, taking photos of, the, of them, uh, you look at the antenna, the antenna is definitely not uh, that of butterflies. Uh, remember that the antenna of butterflies at the end of the antenna is, uh, is uh, a knob, yeah? a club ended. Yeah? But with uh, day flying moths, it's just uh, a regular uh, antenna, the same, uh, no, 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 club and no club at the end. Um, so, so that's a, yeah, that's a, the most, uh, the easiest way to differentiate between day flying moth and uh, and butterflies. Uh, one last question, Rosalie. Sorry, uh, this is talking about. You had mentioned that there has there has been a disastrous de decline in butterfly populations and insects in general. Uh, you had elaborated on some of these causes, but how about uh, forest fragmentation? Does that play a role? Yes, um, right. Uh, I only mentioned forest destruction, but another aspect to the destruction, which uh, um, maybe many people don't realize, uh, the fragmentation um, of forests. So, um, for example, uh, when we were, you know, compla complaining against uh, a development. Uh, for example, uh, some developer want to put a road across a forest. So they, they will say, oh, look, the, the forest is so big. Uh, the road will only take so much, uh, only this acreage, very li little uh, acreage. So if you look at that argument, it seems like we are making a lot of, um, uh, what, molehill out of uh, mountains, yeah? or oh, is it the other one? Um, <laughs> but, but when you separate, uh, a piece of forest into two, uh, there are many creatures that can uh, cross over, yeah? 
um, sometimes they can, but they just won't. For example, uh, uh, many langurs uh, or leaf monkeys, uh, if they can't cross the forest through uh, to the treetop canopy, they, they won't go to the ground to cross the road. Yeah? Um, so what happens when you, you, you have a, a fragmented forest? One, because they can't cross over, one is a lack of food. Um, secondly, there are not enough mating partners in that patch of forest. Um, so when you don't have uh, enough mating, mating partners, uh, they will be inbreeding within that population. Yeah? Uh, same as uh, humans, if you live in, um, in a place and the people in, in that place just keep um, you know, marrying each other, over time, you get inbreeding, you get genetic uh, diseases. Um, maybe you've read uh, about tapirs uh, trying to cross a forest, for example, uh, in Bukit Chiraka in, in Selangor. Uh, since they built that uh, Persiaran uh, Mukta Dahari, um, I don't know, may maybe uh, 2005, maybe, uh, some 10, 10 uh, tapirs have been killed trying to cross the road. Yeah? So fragmentation is a big problem. Um, uh, uh, which is uh, maybe not uh, enough uh, has been said about it. Yeah, thank okay. you. Lah. And you, you had also mentioned to me, sorry, uh, about fertilizers, that we don't realize that fertilizers can affect uh, butterfly populations. Ah, yes. Uh, I mentioned that uh, in Germany, um, there has been uh, a massive drop in pop, um, butterfly species and population in the last 50 years. Now, one of the reasons uh, given by the researcher there is the, okay, we have mentioned, uh, many people have mentioned um, habitat loss, you know, the clearing of forests. Secondly, the use of pesticides. So this author in Germany has given um, a third um, source of, um, of um, destruction uh, of uh, insects. Uh, the use of fertilizer. Yeah? Um, the modern fertilizers, they, they uh, encourage growth of only certain uh, species, limited number of species. So you have a lack of diversity in the, uh, the uh, plant species. Eh? So you have a, a um, very good growth, but limited number of species. Eh? So once uh, the number of uh, plant species uh, uh, are no longer supported by the environment, of course, you know that um, many species, um, uh, butterflies, for example, um, the caterpillars depend on, okay, I didn't mention in, the, in, in my talk, but the caterpillars, uh, like other animals, they just don't eat uh, any plant, yeah? Uh, a species only have a limited number of plant, uh, what we call host plants uh, that they, they feed on. So maybe just one or two, yeah? So they, do, they don't, just don't eat anything. Uh, especially those that are toxic butterflies, they, they don't just eat any plants that are toxic. They go for uh, specific plants. Um, so again, uh, once the diversity of plants uh, uh, go down, then you have uh, problems for the caterpillars, then for the, uh, for the adult butterfly. And similarly for adult butterflies, uh, just like their caterpillars, they don't just uh, take nectar from any 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 flowers. Eh? Uh, they each species depend on nectar, and each nectar they have different qualities. Uh, they have different uh, nutrients. Uh, just like uh, well, we we, we buy uh, different nectars. Uh, for different uh, qualities, yeah? even the color is different, reflecting the, the nutrients. Yeah? So again, um, um, fertilizers, we don't realize, play uh, an important role. Well, apart from the fact that uh, overuse of 
fertilizers, they run off, uh, they are run off, uh, pollutes uh, rivers and pollutes uh, oceans, which can cause all those uh, red tides and, um, and um, well, poison, they, they produce, produce al algal bloom, which uh, poison the ocean. Eh? So a lot of problems with uh, fertilizers. Thank, thank you, Rosalie. Uh, Dr. Wahid, do you have any final words to say? Yeah, all right. I uh, just want to say thank you very much uh, to uh, Therese, uh, especially Lila, uh, for inviting me um, to be a part of the uh, invited speaker for this amazing uh, webinar. Um, uh, and also, I hope that um, the presentation that I shared just now uh, would benefit it to all the audience. And if you have uh, any questions to ask me in personal, uh, you can directly uh, contact me by uh, email. And I try my best to answer. And last but not least, uh, please protect our forest and please educate our children, our friends, uh, even um, other communities. Uh, appreciate our um, uh, insects, especially the pollinators. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Rahi. Rosalie, do you have anything to say? Oh, I have something to say. Um, uh, the Malay names for the butterflies, if you, are, if you can't wait for the book, you can check out my website, rosalieomaphotography.com. Yeah, just, just rosalieomaphotography.com. You uh, click on the, you know, the, the three bars uh, to check out the main uh, items. Under there would be uh, butterfly checklist, uh, Peninsula of Malaysia. So there you would find the scientific, the English, and the Malay name. So it's complete, but still not finalized. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Lila, Chris. Beach uh, for inviting me to uh, to speak on on this topic. Thank you very much, and thank, thank you. you you the audience again for being very patient uh, with us. Yeah, thank you everyone, uh, Rosli, Wahi, and all of you, all the participants today for such an interesting and informative discussion. Uh, bees and butterflies are extremely important to the ecosystem, and is it's also very distressing to hear about the steep decline in insect populations, not only in Malaysia, but also globally. And I think it's a wake up call for all of us that we need to start taking action and we need to learn more about you know, balance and uh, sustainability. And I hope that with some of the information that has been shared today, we ourselves can start doing something, for example, in our gardens, when we think about our, you know, about making it more organic rather than using pesticides and using, uh, and now I have to worry about fertilizers as well. So it's only compost, <laughs> uh, but thank you so much. And we look forward to our, to seeing all of you again in our next uh, webinar. Thank you everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. And Good thank night. you, Rosalie and Wahid. Very, very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Lily. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.